to the info crowd. And the info crowd didn't really exist a month ago uh, because uh, it was just an idea. And uh, thank you for coming because you turned an idea into reality. We actually have a pretty good crowd here for our first meeting, and I'm pretty excited about it. The concept of info crowd is really about uh, information entrepreneurship. It's really, that's a mouthful, information entrepreneurship or infopreneurship. Uh, it's really this notion that we've entered the knowledge economy already and that uh, every business really is going to be marketing their content online, is going to be developing business relationships online, is going to be spending more time getting their message out in a video format, in a blogging format, in, on their website. And that there's a whole range of skills that we as business owners never had to have before. And it's very hard for one person to sort of do it all and to get up to speed. And yet, business on the internet is moving at the speed of light. So if you don't find that fast path to developing information products and marketing them and selling them online, you're not going to be su successful as the person who does. So that's the premise of it. And so far, people seem to get it. They say, yeah, you know, I'm interested. What's interesting is that it appeals to a very broad range of people. Everybody wants a piece of the internet action, right? I mean, millions of dollars are being made if you watch some of these information product launches. They do $5 million in a one-week product launch where they're starting with a list of 10,000 people and they turn it into 200,000 and they had some partners and 10 days later they've collected $5 million. That sounds great. I think everybody wants a piece of that action. I shouldn't say everybody, but a lot of people want a piece of that action. And the question is, what does it really take to do it? And when I look at some of the information entrepreneurs, they have a lot of skills that I don't. So my story is that I'm a lawyer and I come from a background where lawyers never had to market or sell their services. They just waited for the phone number. So we're actually further behind than most business owners because there are two things that entrepreneurs know how to do really well that lawyers don't know how to do at all. Anybody have an idea? What are the two things that entrepreneurs think about every day, every night? They wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to do these things. What are the two things? Sorry? I was going to say market. Marketing is definitely one. So what's the other? Sales. Sales? Sales kind of like marketing. Good, good answer. What else? What's the other thing that they want to do? They want to make sure that they're world class. They have to be better. Innovate. Always create yeah. something new. Yeah, and it's really innovate, particularly in terms of their products. Creating better and better products every day and being able to market to get those great products in the marketplace. Those are the two things that entrepreneurs think about. Those are the two things that lawyers never think about. They never had to have products. They never had to sell their services or market them. And so the typical entrepreneur is further along the path than the typical lawyer is. And so I started seeing changes in the legal profession. In 2008, uh, I read a book by Richard Susskind called The End of Lawyers. And a lot of people may appreciate that. <laughs> For those of us who are living doing it, it's more of a challenge. And the end of lawyers, what Richard Susskind's message was, is that because of technology, uh, because of online services, because there's more competition and there's outsourcing to India and other places, that it's going to get harder and harder for lawyers to continue to do what they've always done. The legal profession hasn't changed in the last 200 years. Uh, lawyers are smart, independent, bright people, and they're good problem solvers. And all they had to do was say, here are the kind of problems I solve. They're a real estate lawyer, or a business lawyer, or an environmental lawyer. And they would just network with a few people, and they would wait for the problems to come in. And that worked pretty well for 200 years. It doesn't work anymore, because there's more competition out there, because Richard Susskind was right. And when he wrote the book in 2008, The End of Lawyers, 
he said, you know, technology, he explained why it was changing, you know, technology and competition and outsourcing. But what he didn't do is say what the legal profession was going to turn into. You know, what was that path to the future? How do you change? And so for me, the last three, four years has been a quest to say, what's the legal profession look like? And how, what's the role that I'm going to play in this profession? And that led me down a path where I started out trying to say, you're just doing brainstorming the way most entrepreneurs would. We had these great posters on the wall of saying, okay, what's the business we're in? How's technology going to affect our business? What can we do that's different? What do clients or customers really want? Um, and we started to come up with all kinds of ideas, crazy ideas. Um, what we concluded was what they wanted more was they wanted more value from lawyers. They wanted fixed fees, and they wanted more what I would call packaged services. And that led us down a path of what uh, I ended up calling our packaged legal solutions. So we got that out there, and we offered them a fixed fee price, but the business wasn't really taking off. And uh, so I still kept asking the question, so where is this industry going? And I realized that we weren't the only ones in, in this industry having this problem. That really all service professionals were having it. And in many ways, all businesses are having it. Those that had traditional established businesses now had to compete differently in the online world, in the internet marketing world. And so what was it gonna look like for the legal profession? And I realized that um, everything that I do as a lawyer, practicing, uh, you know, helping, what I do as a lawyer is, uh, I'm an entrepreneurial lawyer, I work with startups and help them with business formation and contracts and buying and selling their business and uh, financing arrangements, venture capital financing or angel finances, all you know, stuff that other lawyers do. And what is happening is virtually everything that I used to do is you can now do online. It doesn't mean they're always as good, but they're catching up and it devalues uh, what I do because people say, well, if I can go to LegalZoom and get an incorporation, why am I paying you all this money? We used to charge $1,000 to incorporate and 20 years ago when $1,000 was worth more. Uh, now, you know, everything is in competition with online. And clients are coming with a different perspective. They're saying, sorry. they're saying, well, I can download this agreement. Is that, will that work for me? I mean, they're starting the conversation that way. So it's not like just my fear that the profession is changing. I see it on a daily basis. And clients are also saying they want me to partner more with them. They want me to do more coaching and consulting, although they don't call them that. They say, I'm pretty good at negotiating and drafting my own agreements. I just have problems with this one provision. Can you take a look at it? And so things shifted and changed. And so we're going to get into that a little bit more. But let me. Uh, let me start by just asking how many people are and think of themselves as information entrepreneurs? So we got about half. And for those people who raise their hands, uh, just what you know, what do you do? What what about what you do is information entrepreneurship? I help entrepreneurs with their writing. Um, I take the grammarian off their back, I provide blog services newsletters, um, content management on the web pages. So right. I do the writing. So writing is a really important part. You're going to create information. Words, writing, work. What else? All right. Um, part of my business is creating um, high quality websites and driving Google traffic to them and making money via affiliate marketing through them. So building websites, another important piece. What else? Um, Product development for the web, and as well as um, vlog videos, interviews with people that are on the web, or ways for people to connect with authors and teachers or trainers, as well as being involved with a lot of different kinds of um, formats for information, like the blogging, as well as creating the articles that an expert might show on their website, take, you know, being able to take somebody's already created information and turn it into a web-based, easy to, to access. Perfect. Yeah, and that's a big part. So um, 
video production or production of information products, that's a big component. That's different than business has ever had to deal with before. We didn't create our own videos. They were too expensive. Um, we didn't have to market ourselves visually. And there's a whole different world there. What else is involved? Uh, I'm Jules Marchand, and I, I'm a business coach. And I help, one of the things I do is I help my clients monetize their services in different ways and, and then convert them to um, sales on the internet or Okay, so how does that, how do we take the business coaching skills and uh, apply well, it to the A lot of service-based <laughs> businesses, they only have one model that they're working with, and it's often their you know, feast or famine kind of cycle. Well, you know, and so it's getting them out of that by creating products you know, that are convertible to the internet. Yeah. And there's another aspect of coaching, which is that you need to build frameworks. In order to yeah. coach, you have to have systems. That that's right. And systems that's another systems. difference that I, as a lawyer, had to learn. It's like, Systems. We don't take you through a program. We just you know, tell you what the answer is, and we draft the agreement for you. So that, but those are just that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the different range of skills that you have. And we've got a really interesting group here because, and what I was hoping to attract. And this isn't about me. This is really about us. This is really about not being able to do it alone. I've been spending the last three years trying to develop these skills that I never had. And feel like I made a lot of progress, and but I feel like it's continuing to change faster than any one person can keep up with. And when I look at some of the best people in the industry, I see them comparing notes with other best people in the industry to keep up with it. They they can't keep up with it by themselves either. They can't hire a staff big enough, and they're the ones doing the five ten million dollar launches. And so what I didn't see was groups where people were able to help each other where they brought together these unique range of skills and said, hey, you know, I'm really a great writer, or I'm really great at video production, or I really understand how to put together a coaching program that's going to be effective in engaging people online in a video, and I can share what I know if you share what you know. So that's the, that's the genesis of this. Does it make sense? So let's see, I'm gonna, it's uh, 6.30, we're gonna try and do this in three parts. One is we're going to have a presentation. Two, we're going to have a chance to do some introductions, but in a new way. I, I've gotten on a new kick where I'm sort of anti-networking, and I just I think I'm networked out. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to try and make it a little more fun, a little more interesting, if it works for me. And then we're going to talk about um, uh, really what's the format of the group, what could make it really effective, useful for everyone. You know what you want out of this. And, uh, and try to encourage uh, participation. So there are three things that I think are important for the group. Um, three missions, if you will, or three purposes. Uh, one is uh, education. So we're going to have speakers, people who know what, they, uh, know what they're talking about. Um, but you don't have to, you know, today, you know, if you've been doing it and you're out there and you're watching other people, you may be ahead of the curve. You know, we don't have to have been doing it for 10 years. In fact, probably nobody has been. Um, so we're going to have education. And we've got a couple of great speakers coming up already. Uh, we've got Marty Brodsky, who's going to be talking, we don't know, maybe November or December. We're going to talk about the format and then figure out when the next speaker is. And we've got Perry Rosenblum, who Perry uh, is, uh, I love to say, is one of our superstars because he has been successful at actually generating six-figure income over the web. So he actually knows how to do this stuff. I heard him do a phenomenal talk. Where it's just, you know, very common sense, but he knows how to do it. And he, he walked through what his journey was and his experience was. Um, so we want to encourage education and bring on more students. The second thing we want to do is we want to provide networking, right? The whole idea is to be able to meet other people who can help us grow our businesses. But not networking in the sales mode where here's what I do and here's my pitch and I've polished it and, and you know and, and it's got the right hooks in there and I've got the right story and you need to talk to me. Because I, I think I'm networked out on that. <laughs> um, but really much more from where I come from with the problem solving mode. You know, what do you really do and what do you what can we do together and how can we work together? And so providing constructive new ways of helping people to collaborate is the second focus. And third, which I don't find in other networking groups, is experience. Um, and I shouldn't say I don't find it. I don't find it 
in a lot of networking groups. They, they come and they, you, you know, you network and you're a speaker and everybody goes home. What I do find in, in some places, and I think Toastmasters is a good example of that, where they actually provide the experience. And I love that because so much of building information products is getting over the psychological hurdle of figuring out, of, of doing it the first time. You know, I think it was so hard for me to get in front of a video camera and talk. It was so hard for me to stand up here and talk. It was so hard for me to, I had this camera, must have had it six months before I actually recorded something on it. And then when I did, I hated it, and I hated the way I looked, and you know, there's a whole bunch of psychological hurdle. I may be giving you too much of my personality, and if you're a psychologist, you'd be reading too much into it, but um, I think we all have, you know, our phobias, or the things that we're not comfortable with, or the hurdles we need to get over. And so part of the opportunity here is to have a group where we can help each other, we get experience. So um, those are the three purposes of the group, education, networking, experience, and uh, if you like those, um, then um, we, can, uh, we can start today. So any questions or comments, then we'll continue to move into the presentation. Okay, we're good. Is it, is it boring or you're waiting to see what's on the slide? Just wait. Yeah, we're yes. waiting. <laughs> <laughs> just we're, we're trained. We're trained. We're trained. We're trained. We're trained. All right, well, let's see what we got. And yes, I went all out of the design <laughs> template. I used all my graphic design skills. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're a graphic design people, you know what I mean. Okay. So let's talk about the info crown. We talked a little bit about it. Uh, the knowledge economy is already here. Uh, there are lots of new skills that you need to learn, no matter where you're coming from. There's uh, skills you probably don't have, nobody has them all. And really, what's going to drive the businesses of the future are building information products, or our co this content market. These skills will help your business. I'm convinced, whether you think of yourself as an information entrepreneur or not, you're going to need these skills. And one uh, example of that is my son's school. He goes to a uh, experiential learning program in Boulder called the Watershed School. And one of the things they're particularly good at is getting the kids to stand up and do presentations. And they develop communication skills. And they really work in a real world context where when they're writing about something, they're writing about something, a theme that they're studying and applied in the real world context. That's really what business is about today. And it's really being authentic. It's really about taking information and packaging and marketing and giving it to people in a format that's practical and experiential. And so it's already happened in the school systems. And so where we're struggling to sort of put all these pieces together, the next generation is going to learn how to do this. They're gonna already be Twittering and tweeting you know, long before they get out of college. And it's gonna be a natural part of business. We're trying to figure it out and catch up. So who are information entrepreneurs? Well, I came up with a short list, authors, speakers, coaches, consultants, website builders, content marketers. Can you think of others? <laughs> Yoga instructors. Yoga instructors are good. Um, any, any kind of instructional anything, from making buttons to great creating point. cakes. Yeah, it's an excellent point, really. It's anybody who's <clears throat> instructing anything. They're experts. Experts, yeah. Those are artists. Artists? <laughs> Virtually everybody knows. Think about it. I mean, today's world, when you market a product, it's by providing the service first. It's, it's commission based marketing, providing information and education before you ask for a commitment. So, uh, I learned that virtually everybody, whether it be somebody who's like you said, Procter and Gamble, down to um, an entrepreneur, is still in the same game. Mm -hmm. And that's how you engage people today. Yeah, I think I, I'm going to refine that a little bit because what Dad said was that virtually everybody is, uh, you know, Info crowd. And, and, and I would if I had the word potential um, because it, uh, I don't think I have a definition here, but uh, you can not add it. Um, so I think the word potential is important because um, the definition really, when we'll get to a definition of info uh, the definition really requires that they be interested in taking their knowledge and packaging and marketing and selling it online, and, uh, or at least in some electronic. And so that's the one qualifier, but not much, you know, virtually as anybody could be. Um, so the information economy is what's driving all this. And what's interesting to think about, there haven't been that many different types of economies. Now, if you, I looked this up on Wikipedia, and they said, well, you know, the first, so, you know, an economy is really um, a stage or phase, uh, and the first one is really hunting, and then agriculture, and then manufacturing, and then information. Well, there hasn't been too many in the last, you know, two, 
2,000, 10,000 years, whatever it's been. So this is a big thing, and it's just coming in now. We're just at the beginning phase. A little perspective on that. Um, another thing, you know, a little perspective, and uh, I, I got a little show and tell, so I got to walk off stage for one second and grab something. Just take a look at the slide room. <laughs> This, which I keep on my wall. Now, uh, this is uh, a core plane memory. This was one of the original uh, data storage devices used in the 1950s. It's uh, 32 by 32 bits. So each one in here is a little magnetic core, and there are three wires that go through it one horizontally, one vertically, and one diagonally, and it restores one bit of data. And on there, there are 32 on a side, and so this is one kilobyte. And so I put that 1954 down uh, because this was probably the average storage device in 1954. Uh, in 2012, you know, I, for 100 bucks, I buy a terabyte, sorry, a terabyte uh, external hard disk for my computer. Um, and you know, the order of magnitude is staggering uh, the difference. And in case you want to learn what's coming up, you know, there's Moore's Law. Has everybody heard about Moore's Law? Moore's Law says that, um, that the data density will double every year. Um, and it may be slowing down a little, you know, uh, so maybe up, moving down to three years instead of two years. Sorry, uh, anyway, it may be slowing down. I cut that a little bit off. Uh, but in case you want to learn some of the new terms, uh, we put them on the slide. So if you want to get ready for the Yoda Byte uh, external hard drive, it's coming up. <laughs> and to also give you perspective on the information economy, uh, today there are over 160 million blogs. These numbers are the end of 2011. There are more than 550 million websites. There are more than 800 million users of Facebook. That was last year, probably yeah, twice yeah. that. Yeah. 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 skills. 
And once you uh, have the expertise and you start marketing, then you start getting customers, and then you're going to want to ramp up. Oops, I put some nice video down. Yeah, nice animations here. All right. <laughs> so you know, start. You see, it's evolving here from the plain white. We're getting really into the heavy duty, hardcore PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the same learning curve that you are trying to figure it all out. So um, once you get, you know, you get into the market, you start getting customers. And once you start getting a lot of customers, you want to start scaling. In order to scale, it, you need systems. And systems will help you to drive more revenue. And then once you have systems, you need products, and products will allow you to start saving your time. So uh, then once you start getting products out there, you can only sell so many yourself. If you have a great website, you have a great mailing list, you can only sell so many yourself. The key to increasing and growing that business or having a greater impact, and let me just say, it's not all about the money. There are a lot of people who want to become information entrepreneurs, not just because they're going to be the next you know, successful multi-million dollar uh, information owner. It's because a lot of times they want to have impact. They have a message that's important. They have something of passion that they're passionate about. They want to attract other people with a similar passion. And so um, getting your message out there in a big way is as important as making money for a lot of people. And in order to do that, in order to have that impact and that influence, how do you do it? Well, you can only do it so much on your own. Partners is the way that you can leverage it. You can go 10x. If you've got just a simple example is if you have uh, a mailing list of 10,000 people and you start partnering with other partners, each of which have a mailing list of 10,000 people, all of a sudden your product launch reaches 100,000 people. That's 10 times what you would have done by yourself. No matter how big you are, the leveraging factor applies. And that's important if you really want to have impact. So these are the five steps. And Really, it's the left column that I put the emphasis on. Those are the five sort of areas. I'm trying to simplify this, maybe oversimplify it, because there's a million things you can do to become an information entrepreneur. But if you really want to master it and get your products out there, you need those five areas. Does anyone have any you know thing that you think that's missing from those five areas to be successful as an information entrepreneur? Is this a good list, or is there something missing? I, I think the only thing that it might be hidden um, under one of them is the, the, the creativity. Creativity. The, the, the ability to That's present great. the material in a consumable way, um, yeah. in a different way. Well, I, I'm glad you brought that up. Creativity is a huge part, right? I mean, the reason why people buy your stuff as opposed to somebody else's stuff is they get to know and like you, and you do it differently, and it's that creativity and passion that drives it. So that's important. I see a lot of that in expertise. Because part of being an expert is synthesizing knowledge. And the moment you start doing that, you start putting it together in a new way, the way you want to share it with the world. So you develop that expertise and you master it around, oftentimes driven by your creativity. But it's a good point. I, yeah, I would connect that with, with leveraging other experts. Because I've got a lot of content and a lot of creative way of using it. But being able to package it is takes me 18 times longer. So I think at that expertise level is knowing who to leverage. Well, at, at, at the risk of blaring that, though, you might say you need creativity in all five areas if you want to be successful. Yeah. 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 But would, it's, it's a great point. Yeah, I would say each one is married with a left brain, right brain <laughs> kind of idea in terms of expertise and, and how you communicate that often takes a creative touch, like you said. But through marketing, the same thing with design, with people that come with, with knowing what the marketplace is visually, the systems, the same thing is what's going to work for you and how to tailor things. And, and products, obviously, knowing how to create things that are going to fit for the customer, but your, your niche versus mm -hmm. just across the board. And so, so the creativity part of it, for me, because I'm a creative person, that's what I'm saying up there, of course. So, and her being a systems person, I'm so glad you acknowledge the, the creative part, because she's also creative in what she does, but she's very strong in the systems part. And, and so for me, I'm, I'm just looking at each one of these as, as having teams of talents rather than just the particular. I'm glad you said that, teams of talents. I was more collaboration. Collaboration. I don't know where that fits in here, but yeah. Well, it's yeah. partners, is where I would put that. Um, something that's essential, I think, in entrepreneurship is having a point of differentiation. Mm -hmm. 
with there being over almost half a billion different blogs and websites out there, if you're not packaging your material in a unique voice and um, differentiating yourself from the competition, um, you're not going to be able to stand out and you're exposing yourself to um, a lot of different algorithm changes in search engines as well. I say maybe timing is an interesting thing. I don't think tried the expertise. I, I was with Santa Barbara in the <coughs> late 80s, and the guy there decided he was going to put on a show about it. Uh, program on the, on the internet, right? He knew nothing about it, but he read some things. But the beauty was no one else did either. So he launched this thing, and you know, in five years, it was the number one trade show in business and sold it for many millions of dollars. So it's, and there's new stuff all the time. Because first is something, by definition, you just say you're the expert, you can create that expertise. That's interesting. Right. So time to market, being the first one, and getting it out there. There's, you know, there's often a market advantage, but then there's always somebody who comes along and does it better and in their own way. Um, so it doesn't necessarily rule it out, but it's often good to be first. Well, these are good <coughs> ideas, and I want to incorporate them in what we're trying to do here. So one thought was to take these five key areas, or other areas as we define them, and say each of us probably would say that we're more suitable to start in one area than more than the others. You know. Um, Probably, may, may a lot of depends on the person. Some people may have expertise in an area. Some people may have skills. They, you know, so um, uh, I probably start with expertise because I don't have a lot of experience in marketing. Probably some systems. I'm an engineer uh, by training from college, and uh, I really spend a lot of time taking apart websites and know how those pieces fit together and build a lot of that stuff myself. So for me, it would be probably the expertise and the systems. Uh, and to the extent that I've done some initial products, uh, those are my area, those are probably my areas of expertise. But the thought was, in order to have this be more experiential, in order to uh, everyone to participate, uh, is that we could each um, bring to the meeting um, sort of the latest strategies for five key areas. And again, this may the areas may change, but if we look at the five key areas, each meeting we come with one person who would take responsibility or just agree that they would go out and sort of push themselves and say, what's happening? And, you know, and have them make them a two minute or five minute report saying, what are the most interesting strategies I found this week or month in marketing? What's the most interesting product strategy? What's the most interesting you know, strategy for be remaining and becoming a, an expert and staying on top of it? What do you need to do? What's the strategy? We're very, I'm very much strategy oriented. As you get to know me, that's a word that is every other sentence. So that's a lot of where I'm thinking around this group, is what's the critical path? Because there's so much information out there. It's like drinking from the fire hose. How do you consume it all? You don't. You have to be strategic. You have to figure out where do you want to go and what are the pieces you need. And you want to get some help. And so um, does that seem like a good idea to pick each of these sort of five key areas? And again, we may be able to add more and say each month that one person will just say, hey, you know, I'm a website developer, I'll take on, you know, the tool strategy, the technology or system strategy, and I'll make a two-minute report of what I think I see coming in terms of trends, some of the cool stuff, and I'll speak next week. And so at each meeting, we'll get participants who will offer what they're seeing as the latest strategy. Sound good? Anybody hate the idea? <laughs> okay, so now you can see what I'm thinking. So let me offer something else. Uh, today and then we are going to uh, wrap up uh, and then start to do more things interactively because um, I could talk a long time and it would be much more interesting for um, all of us to uh, get to know each other and how we can help each other. Uh, this is another model. I, I'm very much an analytical type. You can see I went to business school because I had to have majors. And uh, I was trying to figure this information entrepreneurship thing out. How does it work? How do you do it? And um, where am I starting? And so I came up with this model, and it's not too complex. Um, sorry. Wrong button. There it is. <laughs> um, I came up with this model where this concept of done for you, I didn't invent that in first and all the time, but that's really what lawyers do. That's really the box that we're starting. So this is a simple matrix where on one axis we've got high value versus low value. And it's really to the customer. Is it high value item or low value? 
And is it complex or simple? And the reason why lawyers get paid a lot of money is they stay in this box right here. And it's done for you. Historically, it was done for you. Right? You want a contract? Yeah, I've got this transaction. I'll draft the contract. And it's done. Where do I sign? Yeah, that's what most clients used to look for. And they would pay a lot of money for it because it was an important contract. They wouldn't bring just every contract. They would bring the one where they were buying or selling the business, or the one with the major licensing deal with Microsoft. You know, it was high value. And it was complex because those lawyers, they write in ways that the average person doesn't, and they need somebody who is comfortable reading it, writing it, and negotiating it. And so if it's complex, then you're in this box. And that's where lawyers spend all their time. So then the question is, well, what's going on in the rest of the world? Because the rest of the world is where the big money is being made in information uh, economy. And so the other two, these two boxes, I said, were done with you. Um, and I haven't seen that term used a lot, but that's really what we're doing with our clients. We're now starting to coach them. And they're asking us just for help with certain provisions, or they just want us to review something that they want a little more comfortable. That's more done with you. We're partnering more with clients. And the third category is do it yourself. And that's what information products are all about. Uh, uh, clients that are going to LegalZoom and they're forming a corporation, they're doing it themselves. Or they're downloading a form from the internet, they're doing it themselves. Whether or not they want help uh, with us depends on whether there's enough value. Uh, I have clients that say that they, and we do a certain amount of market research. And we've interviewed clients. We have these nice open-ended interviews. And we had one interview with a client who really opened my eyes. He said, I have three types of legal resources. Now, I go to LegalZoom when it's just a form I'm comfortable filing myself. I go to my local lawyer who's not that expensive when I uh, you know, just need help you know, getting something drafted, but I don't want to spend that much. And I go to you when I want it done right. So it's flattering. but. You know, most of the time, we're not getting the business. And we want the business. Well, you know, we do because we want to have more impact, because the market's shifting and people aren't paying for the high premium stuff, and you have a choice. If you're gonna stay in this corner, and even though I'm talking about this as a lawyer, because that's my frame of reference, this applies to any industry. It applies to anyone who wants to be an expert, and you have a choice when you start out as to which quadrant you're gonna be in and why. And so, you, you can stay in this quadrant, but the problem is, as computers and, and the internet and Google makes information more easily available, more accessible, things that used to be complex are no longer complex. How many people fix their own uh, you know, uh, you know, plumbing or they do their own home repairs now because information is easy to find on the internet? You know, I, I'm a big home repair guy because I can now do a quick Google search and find a refrigerator part just order the part and replace it and save 100 bucks from repair. Um, not everybody wants to do that. Um, but what's happening is in order to stay in this box of done for you, you need to continually increase the level of complexity which you understand. So as a lawyer, I go from drafting contracts to starting to become an expert in uh, you know, HIPAA or Sarbanes-Oxley, these complex legal statutes that need to be interpreted. Um, you have to continually go up the level of complexity, but you don't necessarily get to work with the audience or the type of people that you want to help when you're shifting up uh, into more complex issues. So this is a model. It's actually a powerful tool um, because it will, we're going to show you a number of things that you can do with it. So any questions on what it is? Did you design that, or is that something you found at Legal Innovations? Is that you, or is that? Legal Innovations is me. Thank you for asking. So one of the things I found is there's, if you're in different, in one of the different categories, the done for you, the DFY, the done with you, DWY, and do it yourself, that there are different roles that you play, different skills you need to have, and different deliverables. And this is really where it's important for information uh, entrepreneurship, because uh, you know I, I start to get confused. Oh, I need to do a video. Oh, I need to have framework join it, but it really depends on what you want to do. Who's your customer? What's the quadrant that you want to be in? And so I started realizing that the role I play, the, the DFY is really professional services. That's what we did historically as lawyers. The DWY, or done with you, 
is the consultant or coach, because that's what the consultant does. But the consultant um, actually needs things that the professional doesn't. They have to develop frameworks. They can't just coach or provide consulting, you know, and say, hey, I'm a problem solver. That's really more the professional service. To bring me the problem, I'll take care of it. But if you're out there marketing yourself as a coach or a consultant, you have to have some training, a certification, or a framework that you develop. And lawyers don't have those frameworks. And you need tools and you need systems. And when it comes to do it yourself, then you start to need other skills. You need to learn to be a speaker or a writer or do video. So this started to open up my eyes as to, okay, what do I want to do? And what are the skills I need to have? What's the role I want to play? And what do I need to, what am I selling? And so the deliverable is what do you sell? And this is this gets gets you thinking. Interesting? It's more interesting. So then, so I then I mapped it. So I said, okay, I'm not that good at remembering all these different letters and stuff. I better put it on the map so I can say, okay, this is this is me in a professional services category. And um, you know, what I want to do is I want to get into some of these other ones, but then the question is, what's the path? How do I do it? Which one do I do first? Where's the money? How do I keep everything going and still be able to pay the mortgage? So one of the things I looked at is, well, starting out, information products sell relatively low price. Not always. You can have a thousand dollar book, but you know today more and more, you know everything's moving towards the two ninety nine ebook on Amazon. So the information products are actually low dollars on a per unit basis to start out, and if you're worried about cash flow to start out. You know, you can have this great product, but unless you have a you know ten thousand mailing list, or unless people already know and love your, you know, how do you make apple pie recipe? You know, you may not make a ton of money from it. So I, I, I arbitrarily put some dollar signs here, but it kind of made sense to me that information products were one dollar sign. In coaching, where people you have a framework and you're adding value and helping people to find their short path, their critical path. That there's two dollar signs, and there's professional services where it's done for you is three dollar signs. So then that oriented my thinking. I said, hmm, okay, so that's why lawyers like starting here. The problem is they never get out of the box. It's just three dollar signs. But it gives you a sense of, okay, if my cash flow is one of my issues, and so this may help help uh, where you want to start. And now there's an opposite effect, which is leverage. Because you may be great at doing uh, you know, professional services, you get paid high dollars, but you can only help one person at a time. You can't really leverage your time. If you stop working, you stop getting paid. If you get sick, you stop getting paid. So leveraging becomes important for other reasons, uh, quality of life, if nothing else. So I said, oh, I want leveraging, so how can I do that? Well, you get, I sort of had the reverse effect here. Information products, much easier to get out to a thousand people than coaching a thousand. You can have coaching groups, but it just gets harder to manage. So I, I, I noticed the reverse effect, which is um, I'm not able to leverage my time with the traditional system. So now I have another piece of data. So the next question is, well, so where do you start? Now that you know the variables and you have these nice tools, and you start to say, where do I fit in? And well, what everybody wants is the pot of gold. I'm not everybody. And um, I'm going to rephrase that. Because there are really two types of gold. There's financial income and psychic income. Mm -hmm. And most of us, to be successful entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter how much money you pay us, if we don't love what we do, if we're not passionate about it, we're not going to be happy doing it. So there has to be a balance of financial income and psychic income. And what's neat about this model and other models that I use is you can think in terms of, you know, Psychic game, well, call it happy points or whatever you want, or the number of people you help if you like helping people, or the number of people you heal if you like healing people. You can keep track of how successful, what impact you're having in, in uh, currencies other than money, or in metrics other than currency. And so this just, uh, I wanted to just explain, when you see the goal, the goal doesn't have to be dollars. And so what the big dollars, the big impact, is in information. <coughs> and that's where most people want to get to if they want to have impact, if they want to be able to leverage their time, moving towards that direction. And the question is, how do you get there where do you start? Well, two rules of thumb. You'll never get to the long-term successful big payoff, 
if you don't get through the short term or midterm. So you have to have cash flow in the short term and the midterm if you're ever going to get to the long term. And so I started out saying, okay, I got to keep the cash flowing in order to do my great work. How do I do that? Well, for me, it was to start in the professional services. That's where I was going to start. Um, so I had to keep the law practice going in a traditional sense because clients keep calling me. They say, I've got a contract. I help them. And they pay me. And so you know, I can't just ignore it. And this takes a lot of time to build information products. How many people know it takes a lot of time to build information products? <laughs> okay? And the payoff is not immediate. And you can get so wrapped up in learning and building these things. So uh, I had a balance to because I had to keep cash flow going. So you want to start in the place where you've got cash flow. And it's going to be different for different people. Um, because there are people who have skills that I don't. They may already be coaches, and they, you know, are improving their framework, or they want to, you know, they've been using somebody else's framework because they're a certified coach, and they're using somebody else's framework. But now they want to have a bigger impact. They create their own framework and want to get it out there. They may start with coaching because they're already making money there. Um, and then other people may already have skills in information products. There are people who have backgrounds in video production that came out of broadcast TV. Or they were already, you know, selling, you know, years before on a home shopping network, you know, some great, you know, infomercial type of product, and they know how to do this stuff. It would be easier for them to do that than for them to sell professional services. So each person's different. You get to decide where to start. But the <coughs> criteria is maintain cash flow in the short term so that you can then continue to do what you want to do in the long term. Once you figure that out, once you figure that out, then. It really comes down to what's the long-term picture look like? What's the mid-term and long-term picture look like? Well, you have to say, where do I want to go? And, um, oh, this is a nice um, graphic. This is looking for the gold. Looking for the gold. Couldn't find it. Um, but you have to start somewhere. And um, then you have to choose your own path. And this is the path that we chose. We started with professional services. And because lawyers get paid for being able to take complex problems and making them simple, like, oh, here's the agreement, just sign here, um, sticking with the complex is probably plays to our strength. So we started building products uh, and information and consulting and tools where we talk about complex type of uh, legal issues. And then we move up to the coaching, but we need to develop the skills uh, because consulting is different than professional services. And we need to develop the frameworks uh, and so we move up to develop those skills in our coaching, and eventually we get to information products. And one of the reasons why we put information products last is because um, I'm working with Tommy Wolf, who's a coach that many of you probably know, or maybe some of you work with. And one of the things Tommy likes to say is, well, if you can't sell one person, then how are you going to sell a thousand people? How are you going to sell something online? And so you really have to go, particularly when you're doing something new, which we are as lawyers getting into legal strategy consultant, um, <laughs> you really have to develop or understand what people really want, what really helps them, and refine that. And so most people go through some kind of a process like this, where you have to refine your skills. And then once you get good at it, because you can create an information product tomorrow, but nobody's going to buy it unless it's really good, whether it resonates with something they really want, whether the messaging is right, whether it really solves their problem, and whether it's focused on their specific niche. So that's the path that we show. Helpful? Interesting? I think the, the one thing that would be an interesting dimension is where a lot of us have done information products for free to get people to know us, right? And to get people to know what our expertise is. And so where would you put the free information? Yeah, the free, well, this is all about earning a living. And so this is about finding the gold and being able to keep the cash flow engine running. So when people talk about free, it's an important part of information products. And we're in the premium industry. We're in the, you know, so um, free is important, but it's what it is. It's a marketing tool. It's not the product that you're selling. And some people will give away the video to get you to come to their live event. Other people will give away the live event to get you to sign up for their mastermind program. You can play it a, a thousand different ways. There's no right or wrong, but you have to have selling something. And you have to know what's the thing that you're selling and why. And everything else is just a feeder. So, that, so um, one other piece. So once you get this, you still want that big gold pot, and you still want to be able to get there um, long term. 
And one of the things that I theorize is I haven't got that big gold pot yet. I don't have you know, that million dollar product launch and the book on the New York Times bestseller list. So for me, it's still theory, but I study and I look at the best people out there because that's the easiest way for me to learn and keep up with what's happening. And one of the things that I figured out is you may start here and go through the circuitous path to get to, but you then have to go back. And you have to continue to master the industry that you're in, the, the expertise that you have. You have to go back, because this is where you develop the expertise. Um, because it's hard to coach on something that's new that you're just learning. You have to go back and do the research. You have to continue to be the best in your business. Lawyers are not experts, they're true experts. Well, lawyers think of themselves as experts because they have a license to practice law, and because they've been doing it for 20 years, and because they started out and learned at a very big firm and taught them how to do it. But they're not true experts because in other industries, a true expert learns to master what they do. And they're continually improving it. You know, if you look at Picasso or Michelangelo, they didn't just do one. They did a little practicing before they did that one great work of art. And so for lawyers, and or any expert, but I think of it you know, as, a, as a lawyer, I'm thinking, okay, if I'm helping to streamline the practice of buying and selling a business, what are the 10 best lawyers doing in Colorado to do that? What are the best practices they have, and how is it changing lately? And not just who are the 10 best in Colorado, what are the 10 best in the United States? And possibly what's the 10 best in the world if it applies? And so it's a different mindset, but you have to go back to being an expert after you've figured out all these pieces, because you have to continue to stay on top of the game. It's a sustainable, long-term career. You have to be an expert. And you have to continue to test those expertise out with new frameworks and coaching and one-on-one -on -one before you do your next information product. Now you get faster at, you know, you accelerate that process, and we're seeing that a lot today. What's really happening in the information world is this whole manufacturing process from ideation to delivery of a product has been accelerated exponentially. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And, uh, uh, just a simple example of that, if you go back 100 years, you know, what it took to build the railroads to create infrastructure uh, and then to transport goods across the country, that took a long time. But what it took to build the internet and to uh, have uh, access to the internet is, it was a much shorter time and it's just accelerated. Uh, so that's uh, what I shared with you is, I, uh, is really this model that I've spent a long time sort of trying to figure out as to what are your choices, and how do you do it, what's the short path, and how do you apply it to each of your own business. So I hope that was helpful. And that's the end of the presentation, and the end of uh, this section of the meeting. Questions, concerns? I was just gonna say there's a, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a book called Outliers mm -hmm. about experts, or you know, the best people in all of their fields, and one of the uh, equations for the expert or the master was that he or she put in 10,000 hours of time into that specific field, whether they were a cellist or a, a lawyer or a surgeon, whatever they were. And that's true. Um, I saw that's very helpful to for anybody who's looking at where they can add value, you know, to figure out what you're an expert in. Where is all that time gone if you're like me in your 40s and you know, what have you put it in? And it's not necessarily what you think. Uh, sometimes it's it's different things that you've done that have all come together to put the 10,000 hours into something that's connected with those things. Yeah, and I, you know, I probably shouldn't take issue because it's <coughs> quoted all the time. You know, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert. And, and then I like that notion because, you know, it brings that quality. In the place, and it says that you can't just put out a crappy video and expect it to sell. You, right. you know, you have to do some work behind the work. Um, <coughs> but there's a way to streamline. It. So I take issue with the 10,000 hours because um, it is actually possible to become an expert in a much shorter time by doing one thing: narrowing your focus. If you narrow it to a small enough area, you can master it in a much shorter time, and you can become the expert. So the more you niche you actually can reduce that amount of time. But I, I love that quote because I hear it all the time and because it, it, it speaks to quality. Yeah, I mean, if you read the 
the, the chapter specifically on that, you know, when he's going into the examples. Obviously, there's, a, there's luck and opportunity, right place at the right time and everything, but all of the people put in really large amounts of time. And then the opportunity presented itself, and boom, they, were, they took off. Uh, I'm curious for, well, the, the, the term information products in general is, is, is still somewhat, somewhat nebulous to me. And I mean, it's one thing to, to have, you know, to, to be an author or, or a speaker, you know, have a blog about something, you know, excel that kind of product. But especially, I, I, I guess, in, in, in conjunction with, with, uh, with law or something like that, like what, what you've done, well, what exactly is it that, that you have been able to do? What, what are your information products, I guess, for that? Yeah, so thank you for asking. Um, so some of the information products that we've developed and that we're working on. Well, we, last summer, we created a program called Optimizing the Purchase and Sale of Business, which was a 10-week seminar, a week long webinar, uh, that we recorded and we put into a, um, a membership site so that you can get uh, 10 videos uh, that um, explain how to prepare for purchase and sale of business, five of them, first five of them, and the second five of them how to manage the transaction. So we're now helping business owners to deal with complex, sophisticated transactions by giving them more information. But we didn't just stop there with just you know, the education. We also gave sample forms, so we have a guidebook. So what does a sample offer letter look like? What does a due diligence checklist look like? Um, we also provided 10 interviews of experts, which were outside of our field, which added more value than we traditionally offer this for us. We um, have uh, 10 interviews to talk about valuation of a business and tax and accounting issues related to buying and selling businesses. We could never offer that before because it wasn't our expertise. We just say, oh, well, you have to talk to the valuation person. So now it's all on a, a membership website. And it's all there. You, you know, there's a fixed price. Uh, and you just get access to it and the information's there. What's your price point on it? The price point on that? We sold that for $995. It's a random sort of number. Um, we got a few people to sign up. We didn't market it at all. And so this is where, where the skills get let down because we produced it, people liked it. In fact, it generated business for us because it did two things. It positioned us as more as the expert. No longer were people saying when they were bought or sold their business, do you do that kind of thing? And maybe going to another lawyer firm. So we got a lot of business just because, just by hey, getting our email and saying optimate, we became overnight the de facto expert on optimizing the person's sale of business. It increased our traditional sales business. The second thing it did was, um, we actually had some people who went through the program, and then when they went through it, they said, hey, can you review and help us with these buying? These were real buying and selling business. But where we let down the program is we didn't market and sell. Because we sent it to our internal list of people who already knew us and liked us. We didn't have partners. We didn't go out and promote it. We were a little cautious because we're a law firm, and we can't ethically partner with other non-lawyer businesses. So we need to take it out of the law firm. And we're now in the process of repackaging and remarketing it to so this is just one example. There's lots of stuff you can do. We're writing ebooks, we're doing stuff. The trouble is, you drive yourself crazy and you don't make money out. And then you get caught up in day to day, you know, you know, trying to make a lot of work. There's another way that's not original with me, but to view that information. Sometimes they present it as a funnel with the information product on the top, and then you try to change the higher end product. Yeah. Basically, you're funneling yeah. in right. your leads, and, and that's essentially what you're saying. Once you got sort of how, where you want to start, yeah, it kind of makes sense to create sort of a funnel. Right, so yeah. you're free and then going yeah. down. So you're and, in, yeah. and as people go that's through that sad. process, a lot of times they wind up coming deeper and deeper. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the yeah. funnel is a classic, um, you know, um, coaching, consulting, you know, information product model, and I hope we, have, we get to talk about that. Um, this is probably a good place to stop because we want to go on to you know, other things and we want to conclude.